Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Analysis. I'm your host, Annalisa Gale, here in the nation's capital. It has been a while since I've shared an episode. I've spent some time working on an ebook, which is available on my site and select stores. It's called Standby, a guide for aspiring and early career broadcast journalists. But now I'm back. This month, I'm sitting down with financial advisor Xavier Epps to talk about the state of the economy, cryptocurrency, and the possible R word. Let's get started. If you're feeling not so secure in your job, then now's the time to do one or two things. You know, cut out a lot of things that you don't need that are just once in your in your monthly budget. We're joined again by Xavier Epps. Happy to have you on the podcast again, as usual, Xavier. Uh, congrats on the success of your book, Budget It Yourself, Comprehensive Guide to Escape to Financial Freedom. It is doing really well on Amazon. Uh, so very proud of you. Uh, tell us a little bit about it and uh, what you hope people will take away from it. And Thank you so much, um, Annalisa, for having me. And yes, Budget It Yourself. Um, it, re, it was uh, number one on Amazon as a new release um, last year in personal um, budgeting and money management. Um, it basically takes my methodology of how I look at personal budgeting and breaks it in three parts. One part being taxes, because you can't do anything if your taxes aren't right. Number two being debt and credit, because I think they go hand in hand. And then number three being how to construct the actual budget. And I look at construction of a budget from two different parts, which are different ways. You can look at it from a bi-weekly, or you can look at it from a semi-monthly, or you look at it from a monthly for individuals. It's, it's always a way that you can budget your money in a, in a systematic uh, fashion that allows you to achieve those financial goals that you set out. Love it. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Thanks again for being on the show today. Today, we are talking about that R word that everyone keeps bringing up that we don't really know if it's really here, but we know inflation and gas prices and the cost of food and everything is really high right now. Yep. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what people should be doing as we wait to see what happens in the next couple of months. Right. So just so your viewers and everyone understands what defines of act, what d- defines recession. So a recession, the, the, the academic term is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. That's the gross domestic product. So whenever the economy is declining negatively over two quarters, that defines an actual recession. So right now, what you have going on is the, the economy is shrinking, it's slowing, but it's not slowing enough to actually go into negative territory. And because of that, that's why we have this whole word possible recession because of, a, you know, technically based on the term itself, we're not in it. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the interesting thing is what happened leading up to the point that we are now is that the economy was held up with all this free money. And I know you remember last year and the year before that we had PPP. And then we had all of the stimulus money, economic stimulus one, two, and three. And then we had all of this new child tax credits. All of that money has the cost. And the cost is hyperinflation. Because now you have all of that free money out there with no support. Mm. And the con- and you know the stocks and the companies were reaping a benefit of it. But then what happens when that money stops going flowing through the economy? You have what you have going on now. You have inflation. Because there was such a support for uh, uh, the level of a price going up that people didn't care what the price was because they had this, you know, newfound money um, from a year or two ago from all of the stimulus. But now that we're coming to grips that that money isn't going to be in there anymore, we're talking about recession. Had let's say they still had some type of continuing packages of stimulus for the economy. We wouldn't be talking about recessions because the, the government is still pumping up the economy with this free money. But because that free money has stopped, we're now looking at we're talking about the word recession. Um, and to me, it's interesting because I'm really big on data and uh, statistics. And I'm interested to see what the next quarter 
of GDP looks like and really looking at the details on what's driving the, um, the, the degradation of the economy. Wow. Uh, yeah, you, there was a lot of people with also good savings. You're so right about that um, because we weren't going anywhere and now we're active again outside, as people call it. Uh, so what should people be doing to, to try to maybe cut costs um, with the rising prices of gas? Well, it's going down a little uh, now, but with gas prices, uh, with the cost of food being so high, should people cut back here and there and save or put that money somewhere else? We're going to get to the stock market soon, but what should they be doing? Yeah, no, those are, those are good questions. So, I mean, I'm always big on preservation of capital. Uh, whenever you're going through uh, economic issues or turmoil in the marketplace, you want to look at preserving cash. It goes back to the whole theory, cash is king. So cash is always king when, you know, everything else around you is blowing up in smoke because, it, you know, the dollar has its own value and, it's, and it stands on its own leg. It's not interdependent on what, uh, you know, what the stock market is doing, what other items are, are uh, you know, how high the price of, you know, a, a milk carton goes. As long as you got cash, you're good. So preservation of capital is, the, is number one right now. But really examining the things that you're doing and looking at job security. I mean, we spoke about job security um, briefly. And if you're mm -hmm. feeling not so secure in your job, then now is the time to do one or two things. You know, cut out a lot of things that you don't need that are just once in your in your monthly budget, or two, look for alternative streams of income. You, you don't want to be sitting around knowing that you're unhappy or knowing that your job may not last very long and get canned and you didn't have time to prepare. So if you can foresee that something negative is going to happen with your income, this is the time to try to multiply that streams of income or look for something else elsewhere or two or three, you know, cut back on anything you possibly can while you're getting prepared for the worst. Uh, because having a, and I always tell people, having a strong credit score means nothing if you have a have no job, if you have no income. The, having that strong credit score just means you got good credit. But if you ain't got income to fall back on, you're going to end up using, you're, you're going to end up damaging that credit because you're gonna go get credit elsewhere to make ends meet until you get income. So I will say focus on preservation of capital and cash right now until things get better um, in the economy. Mm, so true, um, so true. As someone who has spent two months off uh, for the last couple of weeks, I was looking at this credit score like, oh, please don't drop. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> so here you on that, the savings, but also what's going on with the stock market? Because, you know, some people are looking at their 401ks, they're looking at the, just their stocks in general, and things aren't looking so good, especially, I mean, all across the board for a lot of stocks, not just tech stocks. Uh, what's going on? Should, should we keep investing more money, buy those stocks while they're cheap? Some people say it's on sale. What should you do? Yeah. So, you know, this is just my opinion. I, I did spend seven, eight years on Wall Street as a registered broker. Um, so I do have some knowledge and it's some considerable amount of knowledge in the space. Uh, you have to look holistically at the stock market and what it does from a historical and what the future value is supposed to be. Uh, everything is very um, predictable when it comes to the stock market, especially when you use historical information to help you predict the future. Uh, this, the, the, current, the current slides and the corrections that we see in the market, I was actually, I remember I went on a, um, a news show uh, back in 2019, 2020, kind of saying, hey, a recession is going to be 12 to 24 months out. Uh, or I was more so saying a, a correction in the marketplace is going to happen. And here we are literally 12 to 24 months out from 2020, you know, me saying that. And corrections are, are normal, believe it or not, in the stock market. If you look at the last decade or five years, if you, if you go five years or a decade back, any stock that you pretty much pick is going to be higher. Even though it may be down, the NASDAQ or the um, S&P may be down 15 or so percent from the year. If you look over the last year or two or five years ago, it's up. And, and for long-term investors, for people that aren't getting ready to retire, that's a good thing. Now, for people that are getting ready to retire, you can afford to have declines in your portfolio because you're about to exit out of that earning phase of your life. So you do need to work with a financial advisor to make sure that they're reallocating and diversifying, diversifying your funds 
in a way that limits the amount of loss that you can have. But if you're young and you still have 20, 30 more years to go, this is just a blip. And this could be a buying opportunity. Um, you have Google stock, you have Amazon, you have Tesla, you have all these different stocks doing these splits. These are buying opportunities, even though the market seems choppy. Like if you believe, if you look at the last 10 years, you know, 2020, uh, 20, 2000 to 2010 and 2010, 2020 and 1990 to 2000, if you look at those 10 year increments, the market has been higher, higher, higher. Now, of course, what happened in between those uh, those 10 years is all over the place, all type of turbulence, right? You look at where the market started at 2000 and then when it ended at 2010, it was it was high. It was much higher. The Dow Jones was much higher. But we all know in 2008, we had a market collapse, the housing bubble. And that destroyed the market. It, you know, stocks lost 50, 60 percent of their value during 2008. But over a 10 year span, 2000 to 2010, all the stocks were up. So you have to really look at all this activity and say, if this is normal, let me continue to invest. This is not a time for me to stop investing or put my money off to the side and hide it in a money market account or savings. This is a great time for me to continue to invest because I believe the market will be much higher now than it is, you know, you know, from 10 years from today. So I say to people that don't have an urgent need to retire within the next couple of years to continue to invest. And, and the, the biggest advice I can give people when it comes to markets and the stocks declining is that this is all intrinsic. Intrinsic means it's not real until you execute the trade. So if you, let's say you did buy Apple and you bought Apple at 300 a share. Now it's down to 200 a share. I'm just throwing out random shares. Is that 200 a share? That you didn't realize a hundred dollar loss a share yet until you actually go to sell it. Once you sell it, now you've actually lost a hundred dollars a share. Let's say next year it goes from 200 today back to 300. There's no loss. So it's a lot of things that's going on in the marketplace is intrinsic, meaning it's not real until you make it real when you make a sale. Makes sense. Uh, hold if you can. Uh, <laughs> so uh, quick detour. I just want a quick response on this. You don't have to give me a long response because I know you probably have one. Uh, would you buy right now a house? Oh, what a, yeah. Real estate. Yeah. I mean, real estate is different now than it was in 2008. So mo most definitely I would buy a house. Um, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm fine with job security, if I have sufficient cash and if I feel like even if we go on a recession, I can still afford to make my payments, I'll buy. All right. All right. Last question. We're going to talk real quick about crypto and, uh, mm. you know, this is always a good one. Actually, I'm, uh, anyways, I'm supposed to be talking about, about this in another episode soon, too. So the Fed vice chairwoman uh, for the Federal Reserve is saying she spoke in London on Friday. Uh, she said that recent volatility has exposed serious vol uh, vulnerabilities in the crypto financial system. And she's hoping to see more safeguards around it, it sounds like, um, from what I'm reading here in Yahoo News. Uh, so what are your thoughts on crypto right now? Uh, previously, I think you told me invest about 10%. Yeah, I think I, I, I may have been even smaller than that. It was probably around 5 to 10% of your portfolio. Um, and this is the very reason why um, a lot of people that are in crypto space um, a majority of them, you know, being millennials and younger than millennials, they are super heavy in cryptocurrency in terms of portfolio, portfolio they're portfolio heavy. And as you're there, you know, anywhere between 40 to 60% of their portfolio is crypto. I mean, I've met some people, 100% of their investment portfolio is cryptocurrency. So you can just imagine how hurt they are right now with all that is turbulence and volatility. Um, but for the very reason on your, your, your last podcast, um, several months ago, I said, hey, I don't see why having 10% or more is needed in a cryptocurrency that is unregulated, that doesn't have a lot of safeguards, as um, as the, the chair a, a chairwoman has um, recently explained. I, I think we're in uncharted territory. And with that uncharted territory comes your own type of, you know, safeguards that you must put in play. And as an advisor, as someone that acts as a fiduciary, for, uh, for individuals and not just trying to sell them products or sell them insurance or anything like that. Um, I have to say for 
the historical purpose, there's not a lot of history here with cryptocurrency. I could talk about stocks and bonds and mutual funds because it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. I can't talk about like that with cryptocurrency because the lifespan of it is so short and it's still so unregulated that no one has anywhere to go to if they feel like they're ripped off, if they feel like they can't get the money out their wallet, if they feel like things are being held up and they don't know, there's no one they can report it to. So people are sitting in this industry and they're kind of locked in and they're like, look, who, you know, who are you going to go and tell? Who, you know, who's going to check me in, in, in the sense when it comes to not letting you have your money? And, you know, a lot of people end up in court and because they can't access that cash flow that's in crypto in their wallets, they can't even legally sue their way out of the situation because their money is tied up in an asset that doesn't have any regulation. So it is, um, again, my stance doesn't change with cryptocurrency. I still think it's something interesting to be invested in, but I wouldn't be more than five to 10 percent of my portfolio. So what are you seeing uh, real quick with that? Are you seeing just that people are starting to sell while they're losing? Yeah, I mean, you have to understand these these are new. A lot of people that's in crypto never invested before. They never they they didn't know what a security was. They didn't know what a stock was. It a lot of these people just they're just learning about investing through crypto. And they kind of ignore all the basic fundamentals as it relates to investing in stocks and mutual funds and bonds because they, they just didn't go that route, which is fine. This is a great, you know, learn how you learn. But the, the risk associated with it is if you get burnt, it's not the same equivalency when you get burnt or something goes wrong with a stock uh, being delisted or a stock going to zero or you seeing it happen in real time and being able to sell out of it versus it's happening in, in the crypto space and you can't get out of it. You're stuck. Um, I've, I've talked to a couple people that have been trying to get their uh, portfolios liquidated in cryptocurrency, whatever different um, crypto that they're in for the last year or so, and they cannot get the money out. And now that it's going down, they, they're just watching their investments go up in flames. And it's, and it's, a, sad, it's a sad sight to see. Um, but this is going to be a big teaching moment for a lot of investors that are in the crypto space. And I can see this possibly damaging the faith and credit that the investors had in crypto for the future. This may, if, if I can, if regulation doesn't happen in this space, I cannot foresee it becoming another 50, 60,000 in case of a Bitcoin value because people are just so burnt by what is going on right now. They're not going to be burnt twice. All right. Well, thank you so much, Xavier Epps, author of Budget It Yourself on Amazon right now. Really appreciate you. And he's local if anyone wants to reach out to him as well uh, in the DMV. So really appreciate you, Xavier. No uh, thank you for having me. Thanks so much for your wealth of knowledge as always. And that brings us to the end of the analysis. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with all the latest episodes. And if you really like the show, leave a rating on Apple Podcasts and share with friends. See you next time. Take care.